Hello, everybody. I, I, I can't see you all, but I can feel your presence. So uh, let's get started. Um, well, I'm talking about uh, the furniture in John Henry Lorimer's paintings. And um, I think John Henry Lorimer's painting is about light. Um, most frequently, light suffusing airy Scottish rooms such as this, um, but it's also about the furniture that inhabits these rooms. Every piece of furniture in this room, for instance, um, these pier glasses, this table, this chair, they're all um, authentic pieces of furniture and they had significance in the lives of John Henry and of his family. But I want to start with his family and for that, uh, we must turn to his portraits. This portrait of Professor James Lorimer, his father of 1878, shows the sitter in a rather academic pose. Wouldn't look out of place in the Senate room at St Andrews University, but James Lorimer was an Edinburgh man, professor of public and international law at the university there. Like the rest of his family, he was artistic, I wouldn't say he had a particular interest in furniture, um, but this portrait shows him seated in a rather unusual chair, um, very prominently depicted. It is a Glastonbury chair. Now, the Glastonbury chair was based on an original ancient uh, specimen, plain to belong to a monk of Glastonbury, uh, Johannes Arthurus, and carved with his name. It was allegedly found amongst the, uh, the ruins of the abbey after the dissolution of the monasteries in 1539 and subsequently preserved, becoming a kind of celebrity piece um, from the medieval past. And it, it still exists in the Bishop's Palace in, uh, in Wells, in Wells Cathedral. Um, this chair, of course, is, is a copy of that or a a plain version of that. Um, Augustus Pugin, champion of Gothic tradition, promoted medieval furniture types such as this uh, that could be reproduced and used as a vehicle for hand carved decoration. And he produced simplified versions um, of the Glastonbury chair in around 1840. Now the chair in which um, Professor Lorimer um, is seated is a plain version like Pugin's, and this is the, the, the chair, which is um, in the exhibition. Um, <clears throat> but its back has been carved. You can just see um, on the back of the chair here, a, a panel of hand carving. It's, it's different kinds of um, flowers and leaves within the four quartiles of a, of, of a sole tire there. And this carving was almost certainly done by James's wife, Hannah, um, or possibly their eldest daughter, also Hannah, um, but called Laurie. Um, now, during the 1870s, um, hand carving was a popular pastime for, for women, a home hobby that may seem unusual to us nowadays, um, but one that was very widespread. In, in Fife, for instance, where I'm speaking from now, uh, there are several records of it happening. Um, Miss Berry of Tayfield in, in, uh, up near Balmerino is, is, a, is one of the, the most um, uh, industrious hand carvers that, that we have. And uh, she made various, um, various items of carved furniture which exist today. Hand carving like this was a precursor of what we now know as the arts and crafts. So that is the context of the creation of that chair. But as an historical type, an X-frame chair uh, with this peculiar um, um, folding mechanism, although it doesn't actually fold. Um, the X-frame chair, uh, the, the earliest image of it is um, uh, <coughs> an image of, yeah, there we are, Petrarch, the 14th century humanist scholar. Um, of the Italian Renaissance. Um, this is uh, an image of the ch chair that belonged to him um, in, in 1630, um, engraved in, 
in, in, in 1635. So it does have a certain sort of academic appropriateness for um, portraits such as the one of James, um, Professor Lorimer. And he used it again, uh, John Henry, in other similarly academic portraits. It looks like the most uncomfortable chair possible, <laughs> doesn't it? <laughs> and, uh, but if you look at it, um, that little notch in the, um, in the arm, if I can find my cursor there, is actually quite useful for putting your elbow in when you're reading. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's a suitable chair for um, people such as this. Now, <clears throat> on the subject of academic portraits, another um, academic associate of the family was a Professor um, Blackie, John Stuart Blackie, who is in this portrait of um, 1880, whose classes in Greek, all the Lorimer daughters attended at the University of Edinburgh in the 1880s. And he too is seated in this sort of Italian Renaissance style pose sideways, um, but um, in another unusual chair. Um, Again, this is a copy of a medieval chair, rather like the Glastonbury chair was, um, but a different uh, construction, turned, um, turned rails, uh, posts and, and arms, um, a triangular seat and, and curious chip carved decoration there. Um, it's actually an example from um, a, a copy of a chair from Lord Leicester's Hospital in Warwick, um, of all places. But it was made by, um, um, the copy was made by um, a local Fife um, joiner, William Wheeler, in, in Arncroach. And he got the image from the cabinet maker and art furniture, art furniture of 1880. So um, this chair was not made this time by a woman of the house of the Lorimer household, but by a local fife right, using um, an image of, of an ancient medieval chair. Um, uh, and this is um, one of his. There are several examples um, around. I think um, um, the Lorimer family own one, uh, and uh, I've, I've seen them in St. Monan's Kirk and other places like that. Um, William Wheeler, the maker of this chair, um, was a very interesting person, born in 1845, set up as a joiner and wheelwright in the village of Arncroach near Kelly in 1877. And as well as making simple chairs in the local vernacular tradition, um, he also made um, uh, these turn chairs from the drawing in the Cabinet Maker magazine. And I, as I've said, they survive locally. Um, this chair, um, the chair in which um, Professor Blackie is, is painted, was probably owned by um, the Lorimer family because it, um, um, it occurs at, um, at Kelly. But I think it's, it's a sort of mainstream um, um, choice of, of furniture. It was something that was published in, in in a popular cabinet maker's journal. Now, the local joiner's workshop um, of Wheeler seems to have made quite a, a lot of furniture for Kelly in the 1870s and 80s, including, as well as um, things like this, um, chairs of a Chippendale style. And uh, this is the chair I'm talking about here, um, with this pierced splat back. There, there, are, there seem to be three of them here. Um, seated, being sat in by the children. Um, there was a strong connection uh, and tradition of Chippendale furniture in Northeast Fife, um, a long story which, um, which deserves another lecture. But these uh, three chairs here uh, that I've just highlighted um, were inspired by an example of a Chippendale style chair from the local big house not Kelly, but this time a house called Gillings Hill. Mrs. Pittman, uh, the wife of, Mrs. Uh, of Mr. Pittman, uh, inventor of the shorthand method of that name, was an Anstruther of Balkaski. And 
she lived with her husband in the Balkaski Dower House of Jillings Hill by on Croke. One day in the 1880s, she took a Chippendale pattern chair from the house down to Wheeler's workshop, just a short walk down the hill um, in the village for repair. And the idea was hatched to make reproductions of it in local oak. And it's these, um, um, these chairs and slightly smaller versions uh, that we see here that, um, that um, feature in as children's seats in John Henry's um, 1893 painting, the, um, the, the Grandmother's Birthday, Fête de Grand Mère. The model um, proved such a success that Wheeler made an even a smaller version that you can see here for use by the fireside, and that became known as the gossip chair. One of the workshop's most enduring lines that was subsequently made by two more generations of wheelers right up until the 1960s. And uh, these are really are not uncommon um, in, in Fife. A lot of farming families have them. They were given as, um, as wedding presents uh, and so on. Um, but in the picture can also be seen another, uh, you could say Chippendale style chair with pierced splat there um, in the foreground. And um, this one is particularly Scottish in terms with characteristically rhythmic um, serpentine arms. Can you see that, that lovely serpentine arm there? Um, this chair was used again in, um, in the painting Maternal Instinct of 1892, and in which it could be seen that John Henry uses chairs rather than as he does figures, he, as sort of um, uh, as choreographed um, uh, members of a dance. It, it's very interesting how uh, how this is this is so well composed uh, with both the figures and the, and this very rhythmic arm here, which is such a feature of um, Scottish 18th century chairs, helps him to create that that lovely rhythm um, of, of the figures. So the two things are mutually um, very compatible, the, the furniture type um, and the, uh, the composition of the painting that he's trying to um, suggest. Uh, the exaggerated curve of the Scottish chair's arm helped to syncopate the rhythm of the picture beautifully. This chair, um, almost certainly from the Kelly household, was used again and again in um, his paintings, and you can see it here, again, that characteristic arm in a painting called Potpourri of 1895. Now, the use of, um, of these found ho household props, um, things that, that existed in the Lorimer household, all the chairs we've looked at so far seem to have existed in the house, um, is apparent in this painting, A Peaceful Art of 1888, um, showing Mrs. Lorimer uh, there and her two daughters Mrs. Lorimer reading to the daughters, one doing tapestry work, one sewing, um, spinning wheel and a yarn winder in the foreground there. Up in the tower room at Kelly, um, a group of objects not normally found in that room have been gathered from all over the house. A gilt framed pier glass, um, an, an Edinburgh pattern uh, long case clock, that sort of very high stepping swan necked pediment there and columns uh, separately made very Edinburgh that and that's still at Kelly that's still at Kelly as well um, all these objects seem to have been gathered from around the house and helped to create an atmosphere of quiet industry um, sewing reading tapestry work and the implied spinning by the um, although people aren't spinning, but it's implied by the existence, the appearance of that um, in the room. Um, employing the ladies of the house. Now, it, it really must be understood that the arts and crafts didn't start with William Morris. It was no sudden beginning, but started 
as a quiet domestic evolution, just people doing things, making things, making things for themselves and for their household. Augustus Pugin, for instance, um, encouraged hand carving. Um, and it's a pity in a way that this isn't depicted in the painting. I'd love to see a John Henry, Henry Lorimer painting of, uh, of, of Hannah or her daughter chip carving the back of a chair. <laughs> but um, something that, uh, that was something that Pugin had recognized and admired in medieval Catholic society. And um, it was something certainly that the Lorimers um, are doing here. And it was in this family environment, in this creative um, family environment that Robert Lorimer, John Henry's um, younger brother, um, was brought up. An industrious, creative family, and he's depicted by his elder brother being just this in, in a portrait of 1886 when he was 22 years old. Robert or, or Robbie was to become an architect, but also a designer of furniture, one of to become really informed about old Scots country furniture. Um, as a young boy, he cycled around Kellyshire, as it was known, in the East Nook of Fife, visiting woods, churches, and most importantly, Wheeler's Workshop, this little country joiner's workshop, where I think he learned from Wheeler rather than the other way around. Robert went to um, went on to have Wheeler make up furniture from local timber, something on which he was very keen, based on local country designs. And this is a, just one example of, um, of Robert's vernacular style uh, designs that he had made up by Wheeler. Now the Lorimer's local kirk was uh, Carn B, just to the east of Arncroach. And it's this simple country church that has long been thought to be a setting for this painting, Ordination of the Elders uh, of 1891. But looking at it, um, there's something quite wrong. Um, this isn't the interior of Carnby Kirk. It's, um, it's the wrong pulpit for a start. Um, that pulpit, that large imposing pulpit with the presenter's desk in the front there, um, is the pulpit from um, um, Holy Trinity Church in St Andrews, um, which has had various homes and is now in St Sylvater's Chapel. Um, it's known as John Knox's pulpit, but I don't think it can have been the pulpit from which John Knox preached, uh, because it seems to date from the um, early 17th century, um, not from the, the mid 16th century. Um, but that is the name that uh, is applied to it. The painting and its furniture is a very good example of John Henry Lorimer's artistic license with furniture. And um, it, it's, it's very usefully explained um, by a note attached to a print, uh, a photogravure by Aitken Dot of this, of this oil painting, which was given in gratitude to one of its models. Now the model is this man here, James Bennett. He was the village um, uh, blacksmith in, um, in Arncro who worked for uh, Robert Lorimer. Interesting, without the beard or even with the beard, he, he would just look like a, um, a blacksmith or a joiner of today, you know, from, uh, from, from Northeast Fife. Anyway, that's James Bennett. And probably in gratitude for being a model for this painting, um, he was given a print. And this is the print, the, the note on that print, uh, which is now in Crail Church. And if you look at it, uh, it, it's signed John Henry Lorimer, November the 1st, 1900 there. Uh, but he explains who all the models are. They're local farmers, east of Pitt Corthy, uh, um, Arne Croke there, David Smith, um, uh, and then, James Bennett of Arne Crow there, but up in the top corner, he explains that the pulpit is from John Knox's in the University Hall of St. Andrews, where it was uh, at that time. The window is done as Restalrig, uh, as a window from Restalrig Kirk near Edinburgh, 
the pews uh, done from uh, the old kirk at barnyards. So they're all, it's all different um, uh, furniture taken from different places and put into the same, um, the same painting. An entirely composite picture, even the elders. Anyway, from ordination to, to celebration, um, my favourite painting, I think, is this uh, magical um, birthday party. And uh, it shows uh, this girl bringing a candle to the, uh, to the room, presumably to, to put on the cake here uh, in, in the window. It seems to be sort of the, the evening, probably pale moonlight coming in through the window onto the, onto the polished floor. But what I want you to look at are, are these long stools here. Um, the furniture seems to be a collection, again, gathered from all over the house, wine cooler, fire screen, table, various little stools. Um, but I'd like to draw your attention, as I said, to the long stools at the, on the left-hand side, here and here. Um, a type designed by Robert Lorimer around 1890s, and my favourite in his repertoire, uh, made for various places like Rowallan, Money, and of course the Lorimer's Edinburgh family home in Brunsfield Crescent. Um, this is the is is the the type that it, that he made um, several times, and this is the version that remains at Kelly, made by the Edinburgh firm Witter can read this time not by Wheeler and um, of Arncroke, and the feature that enhances the rhythm again of uh, John Henry's painting um, here is the is the stretcher with this lovely swing on it. Um, and that is the feature that Robert liked best about um, this, this piece of furniture and was something that he described as being done in the spoke shave manner. So it's quite a sophisticated piece of furniture, but it's interesting how Robert um, uh, likens these uh, shape stretchers to a spoke shave, which is a, a kind of plane which has that shape for whittling um, the spokes of wheels actually so there's more relation to Wheeler's workshop than there is to any more sophisticated kind of um, fashion um, but in fact the idea he got from um, from Dutch furniture rather sort of neglected type of Dutch furniture at the time that is 18th century Dutch furniture that he saw on a visit to Amsterdam and um, there this is an early 18th century Dutch sofa and there is that uh, is that um, lovely spoke shave stretcher that he so admired and used on his own furniture. The cloven hoof too, um, as has been written um, by, by Peter Savage, was based on the hoof of his own goat, Robert's own goat, old Stephen. <laughs> so a slight um, variation on the, on the Dutch model. It seems that, um, Robert Lorimer um, was that interesting mixture of a, a, a very locally, a very hefted Scot, but also um, a cosmopolitan person, a traveller, as was his brother John. I think they were both the same in that respect. They had that duality of character. Um, John's paintings set in Edinburgh, I mean, he returned to Edinburgh in 1901 to be resident there after spells in London and Paris. Um, feature other pieces um, of furniture that Robert, his brother, either saw um, or collected um, on the continent. And um, this is one of them, this um, armoire. Um, in what is clearly an Edinburgh townhouse, um, um, in a slightly odd position upon the, <laughs> up the landing above the, above the stairs there, um, Robert was very interested in these particular kind of, um, of French cupboards. He uh, recounts his adventures hunting down uh, provincial, provincial French fruitwood armoires, as they were known, from obscure dealers in Normandy. Um, he liked the plainer 
uh, Louis XV variety, large but with no gilt mounts, um, just these deeply carved panels that you can see here. And uh, he even spent his honeymoon uh, hunting them down, his honeymoon um, in 1903 in Normandy. Uh, he bought four of them um, uh, and described uh, his uh, trips to a dirty little hole um, up back streets where he bought um, several for three pounds, 12 shillings each. And they were nice and unimproved, uh, just how he liked them. One that he bought for his own house at Melville Street, Edinburgh, um, uh, is seen here um, in John Henry's painting, Houseworks Oriole of 1916. Um, I think it's the one that was originally placed in a, in a recess in the dining room of the Melville Street house. And John Henry Lorimer has positioned it, again, I say rather peculiarly, up on this um, uh, landing uh, up above the staircase hall, a very cramped space. Um, John Henry seemed to have funny ideas when it came to positioning furniture, but a large piece like this did provide useful interest in a painting that would otherwise be rather Spartan. Um, and he's obviously chosen the space uh, because of its wonderful cold Edinburgh light falling from the, the cupola um, at the top there. But if it didn't have this cupboard in it, it would be rather a, a white painting. So the furniture is very important in providing interest there. Um, John Henry liked to deploy his brother's furniture to help with his orchestration of light itself. And that's why mirrors appeal, uh, appear uh, so frequently in his compositions. The Lorimers owned many of these early gilt, early 18th century gilt framed pier glass types of mirrors. They were a favorite, it seems, of Roberts and had several old ones. But this is one of, of Roberts own design, which dates from around 1910. Um, the viewer of John Henry's paintings uh, must look very carefully to distinguish old from new. Um, um, this design, for instance, um, here, appears not in Flight of the Swallows of 1906, which was painted before Robert had designed this version, but in Sunlight in a Scottish Room, um, the painting that we saw at the beginning of this talk of 1913. So, um, just to talk about the design of this for a, for, for a brief moment, um, Robert's design is an interesting departure from the early 18th century model, the old ones that the family had, because it betrays rather Chinese influence, I think, um, uh, especially in this stylized phoenix here and the, the cresting of the, of the mirror. Um, something that Robert was not to develop fully until his furniture designed for a house called Glen Cruton by Oban, uh, in, in the 1920s, very just before he died, 1927, he began to fully develop this Chinese style. And uh, it would have been interesting if he'd have lived to see um, how he developed it further. But it's just another example of the cosmopolitan um, eclecticism of his furniture seen in John Henry's paintings. Uh, a bit of Dutch furniture, a bit of French furniture, um, uh, Scots furniture, of course, uh, that we mentioned earlier on with those rhythmic arms, but also um, oriental style furniture that he designed himself. A collection of chairs uh, currently at Kelly shows this magpie eclecticism. There's all things here, old Scots country chair, um, uh, chairs designed by Lorimer based on um, English uh, precedent. Um, Fiddleback chairs, which was a pattern, nothing to do with Chippendale, but actually one which is very common in Aberdeenshire with this sort of pierced splat here. Uh, again, an old Scots design. Um, and of course, Robert's favorite, um, a chair in what he called the Queen Anne style. Early entry, solid splat um, chair. And this chair, which is at Kelly today, um, features in um, 
sunlight in a Scottish room, the painting that we started with. But notice how um, John Henry has um, uh, has um, heightened it. He sort of etiolated it. In fact, the whole scale of the of the room has been changed to make it look taller and more airy. Um, he's elongated its proportions to match the height of the room. Uh, there are the Chinese style um, pier glasses that he's, he designed in, 19, um, in about 1910. And uh, there's an elegant uh, mid 18th century French looking table there, uh, as well as the Queen Anne chair. Um, here is the, uh, the chair again, um, used uh, in conjunction with a writing table. I think this photograph is one taken at Gibbleston. I might be wrong, but I think it is in, in the, one of the bay windows at Gibbleston. Um, um, this chair and a writing table designed by um, Robert Lorimer in the mid 18th century French style um, in about 1905 for his wife, Violet. Um, look at the table in sunlight in a Scottish room. It, it's in a very pared down um, French style. It's even got very plain ring handles there. You can see it better in this color picture here. Look at that, those plain ring handles there. Um, he was very keen on Louis the 15th furniture like this. Um, but he disliked the ornament and ormolu mounts in sophisticated pieces. So writing to his friend R.S. Dodds, he said, I still think that Louis XV veneered furniture, when you can get it severe enough, but only then, and looking as if it were made for use, is the finest stuff that's ever been done. So practicality and severity were the two qualities valued very much by, by Robert in his own furniture design. But also um, we've seen so far that he, he valued a mix of, of styles, such as, um, again, uh, French, English, Queen Anne, Old Scots, um, and, and so on, that made, um, that made an interior uh, look like uh, a sort of accumulated straw of, um, country house collecting over several centuries, but placed in a rather light, airy, almost austere rooms with large expanses of plain wall, which is, is, um, is partly the, the, the effect achieved um, at Kelly. Rooms that are refreshingly spacious with um, severe but practical furniture, such as this. Um, And here's an example there. There's the room um, today uh, with the Chinese style mirrors. Um, the room that was painted um, in uh, sunlight in a Scottish room, the slide that we saw at the beginning. And here is the uh, bookcase chiffonnier, uh, again, as an example of, um, of Robert's uh, practical severity. The only concession to detail is the, the, the quartered veneers there and the hardly visible little, little brass or gilt sabots there. Otherwise, it's completely devoid of, um, of, of any carved decoration or, um, or metal mounts. So, um, and it was made by Whittock and Reed, of course, of, uh, of Edinburgh. So we started in a room with sunlight and now to a room with, with twilight. Um, twilight at Kelly, 1911. Uh, another interior of, of spare beauty with a window um, lighting the canvas, but filled with lovely and sometimes exotic things. Uh, in this case, it's a still life with, with a cockatoo uh, there. Um, an interior without figures, apart from the two animals that you see there. But if we whisk off this tablecloth, 
Um, what is beneath um, is a table which I think almost certainly would have looked like that. A circular topped table uh, designed by Lorimer uh, again in about 1910. Um, a circular top with four curious um, um, spiral turned legs, a slow turn, which was a, a signature of Robert's design. Something some say that he picked up from medieval German woodwork. But there's another source, an old sycamore tree that the twisted trunk that grows um, outside Kelly and that all the family, but particularly I think the observant brothers, Robert and John Henry would have seen looking out of the drawing room window of their childhood home, a significant thing um, for the family. And I went to Kelly yesterday and saw this tree in snow and it really is a, a large and monumental thing with this beautiful twisted trunk. So a significant family site, a piece of furniture designed by John Henry's brother and one of John Henry's luminous five landscapes in which the tree appears all becomes one. Thank you. Now, shall I stop sharing it? Maybe I should. Yes, that's lovely, David. Sorry, I was on mute. All right. Yeah, Should if you if can unshare, that's terrific. Yeah, good. And then, then we can see you and, we are uh, good. Good. and enjoy a conversation. David, thank you so much for such an interesting uh, presentation. Just little details that were so um, intimate and that um, we'd never heard before. I loved all the scribing on the back of the ordination of the elders. It's such a well-loved painting and a revered painting. And yet, um, you know, it feels like a bit of a cheat, really, that none of them were elders at all. <laughs> um, but also the little details about furniture, the uh, Robert's goat in the feet of the furniture, um, and just so much fun in it as well. So uh, your familiarity with it and your depth of knowledge was just wonderful and I'm now going to hand over to Margaret who's going to uh, help us with questions. Okay. Yes David I second that really lovely to get that perspective and um, you know we've had we've had lectures focusing on Kelly and focusing on John Henry lovely to get that very specific um, perspective tonight and really kind of homing in on that wonderful furniture so thank you very, very much. Um, I noticed that there was, there was, there's always going to be a question from Morag. Morag is one of our <laughs> absolute um, diehard um, lecture um, and Morag has always got really interesting questions. So thank you very much. Um, Morag pointing out that we should have done a lecture about the pets in John Henry's oh, yeah. paintings. I think we maybe missed a trick on that one. Mm. But, um, one of the questions that Morag was asking was hand carving um, and why women found hand carving a suitable hobby. Did someone specific start this to your knowledge, David? Uh, yeah, hand carving, it, it was a, a phenomenon of the middle 19th centuries, the 1850s. Um, it started with uh, these sort of um, virtuoso um, exhibition pieces of furniture that were carved with things like um, uh, scenes from Shakespeare. Um, uh, there's one, uh, or um, uh, scenes from Walter Scott, things like that, Chevy Chase and things, immensely detailed pieces of furniture, which were, um, which were a reaction against anything made by machines because they were entirely the product of, um, of a skilled carver in, 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 in great relief. And there were, men who carved these who um um then uh sideboards and so on and enormous pieces of furniture which then toured the country um the british isles um appearing in museums and so on and people would pay to come and see them 
because they were sort of these fantastic things. Now, uh, at some stage in the in the eighteen sixties, uh, possibly early seventies, it became it was taken up as a hobby for ladies, and I don't know why that is. I think um, uh, I think it's because there were sort of uh, maybe charismatic carving teachers, you know, who would uh, come and teach you how to do it, and uh, and that was um, something that was taken up usually by aristocratic ladies who had time to do this, but not always. Um, it was simply a um, um, a drawing, not quite a drawing room, but a, um, a home distraction, and um, great skill was um, was um, was found in executing these these things. Yes, I don't thank know you. why it became a women's hobby, but it did. Yeah. Mm. Thank you, and thank you, Morag, um, as always, for um, a really interesting question. Um, David, I've got a question for you. Um, it's very clear that both John Henry and um, Robert Lorimer seem to have showed an aesthetic appreciation of interiors. Was there anything specific that inspired this that kind of defined that moment when they were grown up or, you know, what, what, yeah. what was that inspiration? Yes, I, I, I think they certainly did. I think that, that, um, that you can see that Robert I think like these, um, well, he, he, he identified in a Scottish interior that uh, a Scottish interior, particularly an East Coast Scottish interior, um, was made up of, um, of collected items, maybe from Holland, because um, certainly Dutch things in, in influence him a lot, some from France, um, and uh, obviously some from Scotland, um, um, which came together in these as I said, sort of rather sort of um, airy, spacious rooms, plain walls, not many pictures on the walls. Um, that was what Robert, I think, identified as the, the ideal East Coast Scottish interior. And that ideal, I think, is shared with, um, with John, his brother, because he, um, he depicts exactly that in, uh, in his paintings. Uh, so I, it's something that they both appreciated and they both liked. But... Um, um, it, it, it possibly did come in large part from Kelly, um, from the um, uh, the from the sense of um, of, um, of of simplicity and space and light, and also the items that were that were were in Kelly Castle um, and the surrounding houses, a house like Balkaski, for instance, or other ones in the East Nuke of Fife, um, all have this peculiar this particular atmosphere. And I think they both appreciated that. Yeah. What's your favourite John Henry painting, David? Oh, my favourite is the um, is the birthday party, the one where the little girl is bringing the candle in. Uh, <laughs> not because of the furniture, but I, I like the way in which the little lanterns are painted, the, the glow of the lanterns. I love that. And uh, I I, um, I made a Christmas card this Christmas, and I tried to I tried to uh, <laughs> imitate that, <laughs> not as successfully as John Henry, but. Um, I did little paper lanterns with uh, glowing lights inside. <laughs> How lovely. <laughs> you didn't get one, I'm afraid. But <laughs> no, <laughs> next time. Um, I didn't. <laughs> you must put me on your list for next year. Yes, um, and was John Henry himself ever involved in the design of furniture? Not as far as I know. Um, no. Um, I, I think um, uh, he, he did design embroidery. And um, and he was a sculptor, so he, he was um, and he was knowledgeable about the decorative arts. Clearly, uh, you know, he, he didn't paint furniture that he didn't, he didn't know about. So he was very informed about it. Um, he didn't use furniture as a prop, just as a you know, just as a an object that he hadn't scrutinised. So um, with every piece of furniture in that in his paintings, he was, I believe quite on quite intimate terms um but no i don't i don't i don't think he designed furniture um he left that to his brother <laughs> okay thank you um now ian is asking about the chinese pier glasses in the yes. kelly drawing room mm. and if they're by what i can read uh, i should think so i'm I, i'm not I, I i i don't know but there's a a drawing for them which I think I think must have been taken to Whitaker and Reed. Yes, um, a carver 
in Whittaker, we probably did that because Wheeler didn't really do carving, carved work for Lorimer. Yeah. Okay, now I noticed that there was a question that, um, yes, so um, Ellen Wendy picked up a question from Willie um, saying it was said that the back of the copy of the Kelly chair was carved by Hannah or her daughter. Um, do you know if that's the case, David? The back of the chair rather than the chair. Yes, yes, the, yes that's right. Well, the, the Glastonbury chair would have been bought as a blank, um, <clears throat> and uh, and then the panel carved. So I, I don't know whether it was Hannah or uh, or Laurie who or the, her, her daughter who painted it, uh, who carved it, um, because it seems they both um, they both did a bit of carving. Um, so, um, but Laurie, I think, was the most industrious of the two. <clears throat> so, uh, um, yes, it was just that panel that was carved by them. And um, Alan Wendy pointed out a very practical thing that Mary Lorimer used one of the wardrobes that you referred to to cover the electricity meters at Kelly when herself and she had the house um, rewired. Yeah. Yes, I can see that. Yes, I've seen that. Yes, sacrilege. Yes. <laughs> 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 Covered like that, yes. <laughs> but yeah. practicality, so perhaps Lauren or perhaps Robert would have agreed. Yeah. And Willie's thanking thanking us for answering his question. It's our pleasure, Willie. Um, I don't think I've missed any more questions. Um, just to really take this opportunity before we and um, thank you all for joining us and thanking David, just to remind everyone that the exhibition is on at the City Art Centre until the 20th. We've still got quite a lot of digital events before that, but um, I'm most excited about the fact that today we've got the go ahead to do the ones that I had planned at the end of the exhibition. So Charlotte Lorimer is doing a curator's tour. We've got a lecture by actually um, my old boss, Sandra Marwick, is talking about the um, suffragist um, movement in Edinburgh on the um, 11th. We've got Christine DeLuca doing some of her wonderful um, poetry readings. Um, she was inspired by a lot of the, the paintings. So Christine's actually doing an in-person event. We've got some family drop in and we've got Edinburgh College are doing a fashion show on the last um, Saturday. They um, every year take an exhibition and make garments inspired. So it'll be really interesting to see what they do. And um, so if, if anybody's local and feels that they would like to attend these events, it's very exciting that we're doing events at last. It's two years since I did an event. I don't know if I remember how to do an event um, in person, so um, that will really test me. But um, hopefully we'll see some of you for that. And of course, Charlotte, Charlotte Lorimer, who um, um, co-curated this whole exhibition, will be um, doing her curatorial tour at the end. So I hope to see some of you at that. Um, thank you very much to everyone for joining us, especially our international visitors who've taken the time um, to, to tune in. It is always a delight to see people from far afield. I'd like to thank um, Alan Wendy and the Lorimer Society for their continued support through all of these events. It's been a brilliant partnership with the City Arts Centre and the Lorimer Society. I've thoroughly enjoyed working with them, um, with everybody. So thank you. Um, please do my survey. I'm just gonna pop it in the chat one last time um, just so that it's at the bottom. But I would especially like to thank you, David, for your wonderful lecture tonight. Um, I don't know if you remember, but I was actually um, second year that the Museums and Galleries um, Studies course started at St Andrews. Yeah, Very are we yeah. back? Then um, I did your, your furniture course, so yeah. that seemed like 100 years ago. Um, <laughs> yes, so you possibly now. don't remember that, but I remember it very clearly and how, yeah. how what a fab lecturer you were back then. So it's lovely to, to reconnect with you. Great. So thank you sincerely, everybody, and hopefully we'll see you all soon on the digital um, world, but also hopefully in the City Arts Centre. So thank you all. And um, see you all soon, one way or another.